uh, when I was asked to, to make a presentation here, I've sent the title topics in quantum design theory. Uh, later on, I decided to, to focus on a very specific uh, construction within this. Um, yeah. And this we are going to 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 I'm going to show you. Uh, wait a moment. How can I? Ah, oh, yeah. Okay. So uh, the the main result of what I'm going to show here is uh, that uh, when you choose a certain basis of eigenvectors of the finite Fourier transform in some dimensions, it can be used to generate a Weyl Heisenberg covariant projective two design. Uh, I think most of the terms that uh, were did already in other presentations uh, were mentioned, like like Fourier transform, uh, generalized Fourier uh, 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 Harmat matrix, uh, while Heisenberg groups were presented, and and also projective two designs. Basically, under this definition, uh, while Heisenberg covariant projective two designs, uh, things like six and uh, complete sets of MUPS, MUPS uh, are uh, also inside. So uh, this is kind of a, another structure similar to six and similar to MOPS, uh, which um, as far as I know was never presented anywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me also uh, stress here that I focus on, on eigenvectors, so on rank one projections. Of course, you can generalize all the definitions to higher rank projections, uh, which was for example done in the presentation before. Uh, actually, my thesis, if somebody has read it, it's, it's all about this generalization. It's a, it's a, the quantum designs there defined are about uh, over projections of arbitrary rank and, and, and also commuting, uh, then you can have non-trivial commuting systems and there, so you have include also the classical design theory. And I did, uh, uh, for example, construct also this, uh, because there was a question before that you can construct maps, uh, not only the orthogonal Latin squares and the, the maps, but also something between, between the uh, pure commutative and the, and, the, and the map case. This is included in my thesis, for example. Uh, as well, there's a, count, uh, a connection between the, the six and the, and the proactive plane, uh, planes. But uh, it's 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 important. Uh, one important thing to notice is that this connection, uh, the strong connection, breaks down for the, in this case, because uh, you know six exists exists in every dimension, and uh, projective planes only in prime power dimension. So there is uh, just a remark. But okay, we are going here to focus on something totally different than six and maps. Uh, uh, this is uh, um, this is uh, the outline of the talk. Okay, what what I'm going to talk about? The first is a one slide of motivation, quantum harmonic oscillator. Then I shortly uh, uh, remind you re uh, the, of the definitions of our Heisenberg matrices, Fourier matrix, the proactive two designs. We had it already, but I just to fix the notation. And then comes an example already in dimension three, which shows what the construction is about, what I'm going to show you. And I tell you about some results of numerical search in, for other dimensions. Uh, <clears throat> for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on very specific dimensions, which I will specify then. And we have a short excursion on the, on the Clifford group and can state the main result. And even I give you a sketch of the proof which I think is interesting because uh, it points to a very specific property, which uh, maybe can be used for further generalizations. Then there is a remark on measurements in the sky. Some of you will know what I mean. And concluding remarks. <clears throat> okay, let's start with the motivation. The so motivation is about the quantum harmonic oscillator. All of you probably know it. Uh, it's a very basic element in quantum theory. You have the position and the momentum operator. If you send all, set all the physical parameters, so the Planck, quant, uh, Planck uh, constant and mass and everything to one, uh, you can define the, the, the Hamilton operator for the quantum harmonic oscillator to be x squared plus p square half. And this is a very nice operator. It's probably the most nice operators at all in quantum physics, because it has a discrete spectrum, which is uh, which is even uh, um, which is even accurate distant, and it has uh, non decanorate eigenstates, uh, so they are mm -hmm. well defined, and um, so the basic eigenstate is this one here on the right side. I, I hope you can see it. 
So it's a, it's a Gauss distribution, the, the, the normal distribution. It is, has eigenvalue one half. And the other eigenstates are just uh, this uh, Gauss distribution multiplied by certain polynomials, the Hermitian polynomials. I haven't written them down here. And uh, they have eigenvalues uh, n plus one half, and n is a natural number. What is for this, what I'm talking about, important to notice is that these eigenstates are also eigenstates of the Fourier transform. The Fourier transform has only four eigenvalues, actually, because the uh, Fourier transform to the power of four is identity. Uh, so it has only eigenvalues plus minus one and plus minus i. Uh, so there is no uniquely defined uh, eigenvector decomposition. But uh, these eigenstates are somehow distinguished among all possible eigenvector uh, de decompositions of the Fourier matrix, of course. And um, another question, are there analog structures in finite dimensional Hilbert spaces? This is a question a lot of people ask, a lot of papers uh, exist about. Um, before we go, we, what elements do we have? So the one element we have in the, in the final case also are the Weil-Heisenberg matrices. Uh, you can define the Weil-Heisenberg matrices in the infinite case also uh, uh, as, as general, you use uh, as a positional mental operator as generator for a unitary group, two parameter group, and the same, basically this two parameter unitary group uh, you, exists in a finite dimension also. <clears throat> you have to add, this is the definition here, and you have to add some phases here, which is uh, very useful. It's, it's a bit analog to the infinite case where also this phase pops up. And um, yeah, not much to be said, only about maybe some remark to the notation. I use W here, many people use D for displacement. There's also used X and Z for these two matrices uh, because they are generalized poly matrices. I have more uh, notation, which is very widely used in the physics literature. And um, one last remark is some, in physics papers, very often uh, this matrix, a diagonal generator, there is a one is uh, put, put to the center because this reflects uh, the axial symmetry of in, in, the, in the infinite case. Uh, we come to the very last slide. I will come shortly back to this. Okay, then we have the finite Fourier matrix or finite uh, Fourier transform or discrete Fourier transform or Schur's matrix. Um, the only thing I want to especially point out here is that if we have these four eigenvalues, like in the infinite case, plus minus one, plus minus i, and here are the multiplicities of the of the of the eigenstates. So the dimensions of the eigenspace, this depending on the on the on the form of d. And now there's a question: What could be the unique, the outstanding, the distinguishing uh, eigenstates of this? For a matrix, which in some way hopefully uh, resemble a quantum harmonic oscillator, and the, there is no not one answer to this. I have here a, a short, a short, tiny selection of papers on eigenvectors of the Frey matrix. It is uh, there, there are probably hundreds of them. This is from the last fifty years, and it's ongoing still. So uh, they are come from different sources. So they are uh, mathematicians, physicists, and electronic and electro, uh, electrical and electronics engineers. And the IEEE magazine, for example, these uh, papers were published. And uh, basically, you can say that uh, they focus uh, either on uh, the physics, like the last one here from this colleagues. I think one of them is from Wadsworth. Uh, they focus on. On, on, on being as close as possible to the continuum case. So then you have this is called Herm, Herm, Hermit type eigenbasis. So I'm doing something like sampling the, the continuous case at equidistant points and, and trying to autonormalize them and so on. There are, of course, also algebraic methods, number theoretic methods like Morton, it was in the journal of number theory and so on. Here I give a connection to another property. This is this proactive two design property which is not really in the definition of that, not really algebraic. Uh, so we now we have to, need to go to the last definition we need, proactive two designs. There are many definitions, equivalent definitions of proactive two designs. They go back to the 1960s when Seidel wrote about the spherical T designs. And this were actually, uh, uh, the attempt was to, to, when you have a polynomial of degree T over the unit sphere, 
in the reverse in real case it did it, but then later in the complex case also. And you want to uh, calculate the integral, can you do some kind of numerical integration by just evaluating it on a finite set of points in the unit sphere? And uh, if this is possible to calculate the integral in this uh, by a sampling of finite sets, these are the called the spherical, uh, spherical T designs. Uh, I didn't write the definition with this formula with this uh, integrals down here, but I re uh, refer very much to this uh, formula. This is an equivalent formula, uh, which is also very, especially recently, many papers about six and so on is very often used. Uh, they, because basically these tensor products uh, contain more or less the mon monomials. For example, in this case, I, I, anyway, I would just uh, uh, restrict you to the case of two designs, not T designs. T designs would be you have to take uh, T times tensor products. But uh, for example, in the case of two designs, you have here uh, all the monomials of a polynomial of degree two. And so that's equation which defines uh, two designs. Also, there are also inequalities like this one. There is one written down here, which is very useful for numerical calculations. And we now have well-known examples. The six are projective two designs with D square elements. The maps, which were mentioned before already, are, uh, are um, uh, two designs with D times D plus one. There's also, uh, when you next take the Clifford group to which we come later and apply it to any vector, then you get in, in prime dimension, you get uh, uh, also a projective two design. The last one is an example. The Clifford group is therefore also called unitary two design, but we don't refer to this uh, definition in our paper. We just use projective two designs and sometimes some even skip the projective. So, so much about the introduction. Now, what is the uh, construction? What I want to show you there. This started with one observation, a very simple observation, example dimension three. <clears throat> the Fourier matrix is this one here, very simple with the search root of unity. And it has in this case, even unique normed eigenvectors up to faces, of course, unique normed eigenvectors, which I've written down here. There is one for the eigenvalue one, for the eigenvalue minus one and the i. And if you now take these three, three vectors and apply to each of them, the d square, in this case, nine while Heisenberg matrices. So all of you get 27 vectors by this case. Uh, I've written it down here explicitly. So this uh, c, c, psi, X are the different uh, eigenvectors and apply to all of them the uh, nine elements of the Weil Heisenberg group. These 27 vectors form a two design. Um, well, I don't think it was ever somebody noticed it. Maybe it's, it's, it's written somewhere. I would be grateful if somebody knows the reference, if this is noted somewhere else. Um, the immediate question is, of course, of course, maybe let's go back a step and, and say, okay, we have now d to the power of three. It's much bigger than the numbers we have before already. Uh, of course, when you have bigger numbers, um, you can expect that you uh, asymptotically get two designs when the points of the unit sphere are equally uh, distributed, but uh, somehow. But uh, uh, nevertheless, to have an exact two design is, is a much stricter requirement. And so this is, in this case, not trivial even still. And it's not trivial because what happens in other dimensions? I did, of course, when I noticed it, I did the numerical search. So uh, in dimension four, actually, you don't have unique eigenvector decomposition anymore because there's already a decanerate eigenspace. So what you have to do in a numerical search, you have to run over all possible bases in this stack and rate eigenspaces. And, 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 and uh, like the formula is inequality, which I showed before, you try to find a minimum and, and, and uh, look if you find, uh, if the inequality becomes equality. I did this with several methods for dimension four, five, and six, and nothing worked. So there's no two design like above dimension three, starting with the Fourier matrix in dimension four, five, and six. But in dimension seven, there is one. And as well in dimension 11. And actually, this numerical searches, uh, I found only one very unique solution. So there is uh, all the searches, I use different methods that lead to only one unique solution. And uh, the eigenvectors in this case also could be made real only. 
Um, so that's a, that's a astonishing result. Uh, one remark uh, for the other dimensions, in dimension five, there was something um, special. I could take only three eigenvectors. And with the three eigenvectors, I could form 27 because these, applying the D-square uh, while Heisenberg matrices on it, and I could form 75 vectors, which form a two design. I, uh, for, the, for the rest of the talk, we focus on the sequence three, seven, and 11. Uh, I will come to back to the general case uh, at, the, at the end. And actually, uh, I'm going to construct it now. I'm going to give a construction how these uh, eigenvectors of the free matrix look like in these dimensions and uh, going to prove it also. So that's the main part of this talk. Uh, uh, the, at, the, at the end, we will pose some questions if this can be generalized and so on. Okay. Uh, if anyone has a question up to now, I mean, uh, you can do it, but just speak out loud that I, I notice it and can answer. Okay. Um, to, to, to proceed, we need another concept, the concept of Clifford group, which was also already, I think, on the first day, they talk about six. It was mentioned quite frequently. The Clifford group is the normalizer of the well, Heisenberg group in the unitary matrices, and it's actually, there's a homology to the to the uh, two times two matrices over, uh, with entries modulo D. Um, I focus here on dimension D to be odd because uh, in even cases, there is some technical, uh, maybe the kind of overlay structure. I don't, we don't go into these details here. Uh, of course, a Fourier matrix is an element of the Clifford group. And we can now ask for all of the subgroup of all elements of the Clifford groups that commute with the Fourier matrix. And it turns out that they have this form. So basically the gamma becomes a minus beta and the delta becomes the alpha and, and, and alpha square plus beta square is one. This is a requirement to be in the special linear group. This group is in any case ab abelian, commutative, and for odd primes, it is a cyclic group, even of the order di d minus one or d plus one, depending on the form of the d. Um, yeah, what we need now is uh, a representation of this of this element in the in the in the complex matrices, in the d square times d square complex matrices. Such kind of representation is given by Appleby, for example, has written a lot of uh, papers about it, very detailed analysis of all it. We focused this very specific uh, subgroup here again, alpha beta. And when we uh, skip the special cases when beta is zero, which means that alpha is plus minus one to the requirement that alpha square plus beta square is one, um, which is uh, identity of minus identity, then you have this kind of representation in the standard basis. Um, what is for our purpose more appropriate is to look for another representation. And uh, we notice that the while Heisenberg matrices are actually uh, build a basis in the, in the space of all matrices. They are an orthogonal basis even in the space of matrices. And therefore we can also expand the, the, this, this matrix here in, in terms of the while Heisenberg matrices. This was already actually done uh, quite a long time ago by Ballion and Eustixen in 1986 already and later by some um, Greek authors. And uh, it looks like this. They did it for the general uh, Clifford group. Uh, we restrict to the subgroup again. And it looks like this here. Uh, again, with the exception that uh, in this case, uh, beta is, is zero because uh, our alpha is one. This, this is a restriction because if alpha would be one, then the formula would break down. Uh, so it's exactly except the, uh, the case where it's an identity matrix. And we don't care about the phases anyway, by the representation. Huh? We can further simplify this in case we have a prime of the form D is 4K plus three, because we can replace this beta divided by two times I minus alpha by just an M, M between zero and D, D minus one. There is this one-to-one -one map and this one-to-one -one map is well-defined because in this case, in this dimension 4K plus three prime, uh, this uh, this, demon, uh, this uh, 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 formula below here for m squared plus one has never is never zero. Uh, it have because it, uh, in this case uh, there is no uh, quadratic residue 
for uh, minus one is not a quadratic procedure. And now what Balion and Dixon in 1986 say are working at, at CERN at this time and uh, on lattice theories and quantum field theory actually, and they stumbled about these things. And they observed 1986 already that when you take this kind of matrices, they provide a unique common orthogonal basis of eigenvectors of the Fourier matrix. Yeah, the Fourier matrix, by the way, it's, it's an element of this group, as I said before, by definition, and it uh, corresponds to the to M is uh, D, D minus one over two. Okay, and now we come to the main theorem of, of my talk. And the main theorem of my talk is uh, the following. Let D be this dimension for K plus C prime. And let this psi I be the unique common orthogonal basis of eigenvectors of this D matrices. The, and you then generate this d square vectors by applying the d, d, d to the power three of three vectors by applying the d square while high matrices on each of these uh, eigenvectors, then you get the projective two design. That's uh, the, the main result here, stated here. Um, well, how do you prove it? I mean, uh, it looks a bit difficult because first of all, you would have to calculate the eigenvectors. And actually it turns out this calculation of these eigenvectors is quite complicated. So the authors which I mentioned before did something in this direction. You get into a lot of number theory and so on. As it turns out, uh, there is actually, it's possible to prove it without even calculating the eigenvectors directly, just by using some properties of the RM. And uh, that's what I want to show you on the next four slides, roughly. It's a bit technical, so if you are already bored uh, up till now, then you can skip the next four slides. For <laughs> Otherwise, uh, I think it's interesting to, to give a sketch of the proof because it reveals some, some very nice property, which is essential for this whole construction and is all related to the sick topic and so on. <clears throat> okay, the strategy of the proof. The strategy of the proof is that we take these eigenvectors and general make the, the rank one projections uh, for them, which relate to them. And then we apply the Weil Heisenberg group to each of these vectors. So that's where, how we get this d to the power of three projectors. And what we are going to prove is we take the formula, which I mentioned before. So we take the tensor products of these uh, projectors with itself, sum them up uh, over the D square is a, is a D to the power of three is the number of elements. And this should be this expression on the right side. That's a strategy, how to prove it. And the strategy is that we expand the projections as well as the expression on the right side, all in terms of the Weil Heisenberg matrices. So that at the end, we get the equation only about Weil Heisenberg matrices with some coefficients, and um, we can and we can prove it. Uh, the, the right side is actually well known. Uh, I will show it to you later. It's, it's not so complicated. The complicated side is, is the left side and the expansion of the projections in terms of the, of the Weil Heisenberg matrices. And uh, here I give a short sketch how this is done. Uh, forget the other half, upper half of, the, of this slide now. It's very technical. Look at the lower half. The PIs can be actually written in this form, which is written, I've written down here. So it's a representation of the PIs in, in the basis of the Weil Heisenberg matrices with this coefficients, co coefficients, a PI, RS. Um, there's a factor here, and there is, uh, I've, I took it's out the identity. The connection right? is bad. We can't hear uh, you. We lost the uh, last few sentences. Okay. Uh, I said, okay, uh, we focus on the lower half of the presentation here. And uh, first of all, I'll give you a short uh, um, remarks on the upper half later. But if you look at the lower half, this is a representation of the projectors on the eigenvectors uh, in terms of the Weil Heisenberg matrices, which forms the basis of all matrices. And these are the coefficients here. And uh, I, uh, uh, I took uh, the identity, I took it separately, so with some factor. It's also included, it's included two times because of course identity is also a Weil Heisenberg matrix, matrix uh, for R is zero and B, uh, S is zero. So it's, it turns, uh, there's a PI 
zero zero is here. It's already about, uh, but it makes uh, it for some technical reason. This is the best way to present it. And uh, what we can actually prove is uh, these three properties, which are below here. The first two are rather trivial. It's the first one you can prove just by taking the trace of the formula above. The second one just reflects that the PIs are, are, are self-adjoint. The real interesting one is this last one. We can prove actually that we start with this uh, definition of the project as we did, that uh, if you fix if you fix the RS for any fixed RS, and you take the values for the i i between zero and d minus one. This vector has a, 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 two, a two, uh, Euclidean norm, a, a two norm d. Uh, I just want to to compare it shortly for those of you working with the SIG. If this peer project would be a, a, a fiducial protector for a SIG then we would have here, this PI would be this overlaps actually. And we would have the property that uh, this uh, PX, if PX is the fiducial projector, would have, have absolute values square is one. Uh, if you would take D copies of a SIG, uh, there, which is a two design also, because if you take the uh, add up uh, two designs, say, say state two designs, then you would have uh, just the same formula like above here. You would have for each of them uh, that the absolute value square is one, and then summed up, uh, it's D. So it's a generalization of, or somehow of the property, which is otherwise a SIG definition. But actually, the PIs itself have not absolute value one. So the, about the other upper half, uh, the, how to prove this, that's a bit Excuse technical. And, uh, yeah. Uh, we had some technical problems. Could you? Uh, go by back maybe three minutes. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, just explain this slide from uh, from the beginning. Very, very sorry, but we lost our connection. Okay. Uh, so we we, uh, we had this uh, approach. This is a, a strategy. How to okay. That's okay. Yes, yes, yes. That was okay. And then next slide. Okay. So there's, there's a hard uh, thing, as I said, is of course to have the left, left side, the PI to be expressed in terms of the wild Heisenberg matrices. And this is also the most difficult slide what is coming on the whole presentation. It's a very technical slide. <clears throat> I said uh, for, the, for the beginning, I want uh, you to, to forget about the half, upper half of this slide. We focus on the lower half of the slide. And the lower half of the slide says that these PIs can be represented in this form. Um, these are the wild Heisberg matrices, which are form a basis for the uh, all matrices, and these are the co co coefficients. And as I said, also uh, you can I did uh, pull out the identity here. This is for some technical reason. But yeah, the identity is also wild Heisberg matrix, so you could include it here in the formula. Um, the interesting thing about when you present it uh, in this form, you can prove properties of this of this coefficient, and 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 there are these three properties. The first two being rather trivial. The first one is uh, just by taking the trace of this formula. The second one reflects just that the PIs are self-adjoint, but uh, the the real uh, uh, interesting property is the last one. So the last one says, if you start fix uh, the, the RS so for any fixed while Heisenberg matrices and you take this coefficients for different projectors, uh, you get a vector which has uh, Euclidean norm D in any case. Um, what I wanted to point out for some of you working with the six, uh, this has a striking analogy to when you start when the P, 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 X, but this will be, a fiducial protector for a while well, Heisenberg covariant sick, because in this case, this PXRS would be uh, the, the overlaps. They would have absolute value one. And uh, if you would take D copies of, of a sick, which is also a two design, then you will get this formula above. But this formula above uh, does not say anything about uh, the single values. <clears throat> So that's a, 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 a property we need. Actually, it's all we need for the proof of the theorem, what I said before. So the upper half is about, it gives a short sketch of how, we, how to get to this uh, formula and to this property. 
Basically, it's a geometric construction. We start with the properties of the RM, and we notice that uh, they have this uh, uh, kind of uh, inner product in the sense of the Hilbert-Schmidt norm. And it only works for D is 4K plus C and, and, and prime. It uses Lachandre symbol and, 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 and Gaussian sums actually. And then you can do some autonormalization because they are commuting matrices. We know we noticed before a abelian group uh, that uh, that you can do and you can diagonalize them at the same time. And then you would under uh, this diagonal, which is d-dimensional, you would could do an autonormalization. You can do, define this uh, auxiliary matrices this way up here, and then. You notice that uh, the eigen projectors of the eigen value uh, uh, ve values are actually also a uh, 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 autonormal basis on the same sp uh, space of matrices on the same d-dimensional space of matrices, and so the map from this auxiliary map, if you write the PIs in terms of the auxiliary matrices, you have a unitary map, and when you put all of this together, you find out that this leads to this formal here. Okay, that's technically, if somebody is really interested in the details, I've prepared a small paper about it and, and I, everyone who's interested can get it. There it is uh, calculated in exactly detail. Um, yeah, and that's a property we need to prove the theorem actually, because the right side, which is the expression of this uh, symmetric tensor in terms of the Wall-Heisenberg matrices is actually, uh, uh, well known, it is this formula down here. Actually, you find it uh, indirectly already. Do you hear me already uh, still? Because I'm a little bit confused. There is some video to be seen. Is it okay? Do you hear me? Hello? <clears throat> I hear you, but I don't know about the other participants. Ah, okay. I can also yeah, hear you, hear but there are some yes, problems in the main room. Hear you in your name. Okay, so I can go to continue, right? Yes, please. Okay, so the formula below here is actually, for example, it's uh, in the paper by 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 Danilo was uh, this co-author was uh, included already, uh, but it's actually very elegant to prove it, which as a special case of a uh, result zero that was recently shown in a paper. Because it's basically true, you can write a swap operator in this form, and this is basically true for any kind of uh, autonomous basis of in the, in the space of matrices. And then when you notice that uh, swap operator has this eigenvalue of plus one for the symmetric and minus one for the asymmetric uh, tensors, then you can write the symmetry operator this way and you get this formula. So that's quite simple. Um, the okay, and that's basically it because uh, the proof of the is, is the rest of the proof is just some kind of magic of some Weil-Heisenberg matrices. You insert this form of the projector in this formula here, which I mentioned before. You insert the for the symmetric tensor uh, represented in terms of some Weil-Heisenberg matrices in here. You have a formula which is only about Weil-Heisenberg matrices with this coefficient, and when you use this property, you can prove that it is uh, fulfilled. <clears throat> okay, uh, as I said, uh, I don't know if you have heard it because of some of these uh, disruptions. Uh, uh, details are in a, in, a, in a paper which I have written, and if somebody's interested, you can get a copy of it. Okay, so we are nearly finished, and I have 10 minutes, so it's time to... I have, I have two more topics. One topic is an uh, application of this kind of application. And then there are these concluding remarks, which is also to split into two parts. Well, this kind of application is based on a, on a, on a result, which uh, two of the people which organized this meeting, I think Anna is in the, in the audience at least. I don't know if, the, if uh, uh, Wojtek is also there. They actually noticed in a paper just a few years ago that the two design uh, can be also characterized uh, by this equation. So that for any matrix uh, row, which uh, trace one, if it can be represented in this way, then uh, the projectors form a two design. 
Actually, for those of you which are surprised of the formula and haven't don't know the paper of, uh, of the of the uh, of the inventors of this formula, I can give you a sketch uh, a sketch of a proof. It's actually very simple to prove this formula, because when we use uh, the def definition of two designs, we have used all the times so that this definition here down here, the tensor product definition, write it out directly using the swap operator uh, uh, for the for the for the definition of the symmetric tensor. We can uh, multiply this equation by the identity matrix tensor product with rho, rho, rho being any kind of matrix, and applying the partial trace on the second term. And we can use this formula, which again, Siebert has shown recently, which is a very nice formula. So that's the tensor product of uh, identity matrix with any matrix rho with times a swap matrix is actually rho. And then if you do this, you get this result very quickly. And uh, it actually is a more general result because you have here the trace rho here, but if you assume trace rho is one, uh, then you get this formula. And as a consequence, we can apply it to our results. We have constructed an infinite sequence of two designs and we can do what uh, some people call measurement in the sky. We can do the following. We can use our, our, our uh, D to the power of three projectors, which we constructed as before. And uh, then in this case, uh, for any matrix with trace one, this formula applies. So the row can be written as, uh, as a sum over the, these projectors with its coefficients and the coefficients given by this formula. Uh, this is actually as a counterpart to the quite well-known in some, in, at least in some equation, which got a great deal attention in the context of the cubism approach of quantum theory. Maybe somebody know it by Chris Fuchs and others, some collaborators. Uh, which called it the measurement in the sky, and they uh, used the same equation for the SIG, which has also two designs. So basically, uh, it shows that this kind of measurement in the sky is not very unique for SIG. It applies for any kind of two designs, which uh, uh, Anna and, and, and Wojtek actually noticed, and we have here an example, and I, uh, which is also physically interesting, maybe. So basically, uh, I'm, I've, I've done my presentation and I come to the two concluding remarks. We can now spend some time on the concluding remarks and possibly some questions. Uh, the first uh, concluding remark is, of course, what could be further, possible further research? What we have done here is we, we've, we made a construction for uh, dimensions D of the form 4K plus three being prime. What about the other dimensions? Uh, I noticed, okay, it's already that in case dimension five, there is something with a subset of eigenvectors of the Fourier matrix. So is there any way how to generalize these constructions for other dimensions D? You could think of using weighted two designs uh, as, as a of the defining property. So to introduce some weights, maybe then they exist also for, for you can generalize it to higher rank projectors. Uh, you can, you can also uh, start with other matrices and the Fourier matrix and apply the same kind of methodology, which I uh, showed here. Actually, all of this is a, a, a subsides into, into, into this very general uh, question, which I have here on the right side. Uh, this is the question is uh, the observation is we have, if we have a set of rank one projector matrices, they can be either covariant with the Val Heisenberg group. So the well, Heisenberg group can just permute this uh, rank one projection matrices, or they can be, be a projective two design. And now in the overlap, if they have both of these properties, there lies a SIG and the MAP. And there lies also this result, what we constructed here. There lie, lies also this one example, which I gave before this by the Clifford group, generated by the Clifford groups, this unitary Clifford group. Uh, the question is, or my actually my strong guess is that there is much more in this overlap, and it would, could be possibly very interesting to to analyze this uh, this overlap uh, further. Okay, so this is a, 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 a first uh, remark I want to make, concluding remark. Uh, now I come to the second one, which is a bit speculative. 
<clears throat> discrete versus continuum. Uh, as I said before, uh, the eigenvectors we const constructed for the frame matrix are all real valued. So, in, for example, in case D7, you could take these eigenvectors, real values, and make uh, print them here as step functions. Uh, now I come back to the one remark I made before. It's actually I took uh, the, the value here. The center is the first value of the vector. This is the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. So cycling around. This has to do that we have to shift them because of the fact that we have uh, started uh, very beginning with this while matrices where the one was at the top upper left corner, not at the center of the of this diagonal generator of the of the of the wild isomer group, and and to compare it with uh, with if, uh, continuum results, we have to repair this. Okay, uh, I printed uh, this seven eigenvectors in dimension seven here on the on the uh, as, as step functions and compared them to the continuum quantum harmonic oscillator eigenstates. At first sight, with some imagination, you could uh, think that it is come our uh, converging or approaching this, uh, this two sort of kind of solutions. Actually, um, this is not the case. Uh, I did, there's a, a good reason why I did print it only for dimension seven, not for higher dimensions. Uh, first of all, of course, it would be too many vectors, but the other thing is uh, the picture doesn't get any better. Uh, the even worse, uh, the, there is no point wise convergence and there's even I think at least uh, no other kind of really uh, nice convergence of these two objects in this sense. Um, in a certain sense, this has to do, I mean, if you look at it from the result we are just uh, given is uh, the two design property itself is not about a single vector, so a single point of the unit sphere. If you think of the original definition per side and so on, it was not that any single value on the unit sphere is somewhat converging to, to any result. It is about that you take, take the whole set and then you can make some convergence. <clears throat> so uh, two designs are about average values of certain integrals compared to integrals. And uh, the question is, of, in, but in this sense, they make a, a connection between the finite and the continuum. And the question is now if this can be extended to a, to a connection of this construction here at, at the end to the, to the quantum harmonic oscillator. Okay, that's it. Are you still here? Do you hear me? Thank you.